have the honor of uh, introducing our first speaker. Today's first session, Big Data Privacy and the Public Good. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Julia Lane. Dr. Lane is a professor at CUSP and NYU's Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Uh, Dr. Lane is an accomplished author of over 65 reference articles um, and has also edited or authored seven books. Uh, Dr. Lane received her PhD in economics uh, and master's in statistics from the University of Missouri. Please welcome Dr. Lane. Okay, so uh, yes, as he said, I, uh, I'm a, at NYU, so this is a New York accent, which you'll immediately <laughs> recognize. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm an economist by training uh, and have kind of spent most of my career working with large scale data sets. Um, initially large scale administrative data sets from a variety of federal agencies, um, uh, tax data, Census Bureau data, Social Security Administration data and so on and merging and linking them. And that's where I first got interested in, um, in the uh, confidentiality issues. Because when you're dealing with universe data from tax agencies, from survey data, uh, from unemployment insurance wage records data, and you want to integrate them um, to understand what's going on in the economy and in, um, in society, if you don't pay attention to the fact that you're working with data on human subjects, you're not going to get very far, both from an ethical and from an operational standpoint. And so kind of what happened was I spent 20 years bringing in universe data on all jobs for all workers in all firms in all 50 states using unemployment insurance wage record data, integrating them with tax records, census data, and so on. Um, and uh, spent a fair bit of time then also figuring out what the confidentiality issues were associated with that. And I'll talk about that a little bit this morning. Um, and then I went to the National Science Foundation in about 2004. Um, and because I'd done all that work, uh, they asked me to head up the Social, Behavioral and Economic Sciences Cyber Infrastructure Initiative. And as part of that, that was when I first realized, boy, economists are not the masters of the universe. This was news to me. Uh, it still is news to a lot of economists. Um, and that the computer scientists were now moving way beyond administrative data. And that was when you realized they were getting stuff from text analysis, pulling in data from a variety of different sources. But, oh my goodness, the world is changing and confidentiality is going to change with it. So even the stuff I'd done with universe administrative records, as big as that was back in the day, um, the, the world's going to change for social science, behavioral and social science research. Um, so over the past uh, 10 years, I've really been working pretty closely with computer scientists as well uh, to try to figure out um, how, how we can um, uh, address the confidentiality issues in this world. So, so that's the background and the context of, from which I'm going to be speaking. And I've been a faculty member for a long time, so one of the things I've learned is you tell people at the beginning what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then at the end you tell them what you told them. So this is what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> These are kind of the key things. So when you end today, there's a quiz. No, really not. Um, and uh, these are kind of the key ideas. I want you to, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but at least in the social sciences, uh, there's a long history of thinking about how to disseminate uh, confidential microdata, largely driven by the federal statistical agencies. And now that we have these new data, in the, uh, and not just new data, but new tools, new linkage um, approaches, uh, we've got not only a huge opportunity for behavioral and social science, but, but huge risks as well. Um, and, and if we're going to work with these data in a responsible and ethical way, um, we've got to address this. Uh, and actually, last night I had to go and talk to a, a group of hackers who, who work with open data. I, I tell you, if I were to add up all of their ages, it wouldn't add up to my age. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing here? Um, 
But, you know, they were all talking about mashing data together from different sources. And I said, well, what about privacy and confidentiality? It had not even occurred to them, right? So you've got people who are pushing data together and who are not aware of the risks. And, and part of what I'm going to talk about is, is how to raise that awareness. Um, what it also means, uh, what I'm also going to argue is that access is more important than ever. Why is access important? Because this is hard, complex uh, work that ha was historically done by the federal statistical agencies with skilled math stats and, and survey methodologists. And now that the work of, of, with data is not nearly, uh, the hegemony of those agencies has disappeared, and it's being done by these hackers. And in order to be able to replicate the work, you need access, and you need to replicate to, to validate. Um, and so we need to think about new, new, new uh, approaches. Okay, so those are the key ideas. And so this is how I'm going to uh, walk through it. I'm going to, I know many of you are already familiar with this, so I'm probably teaching my grandmother to suck eggs here. I'm going to give you kind of an overview of privacy and confidentiality. I'm going to convince you, I hope, why access is important. Again, I'm fairly sure that I don't need to tell this group that, but we'll do it anyway. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what framework we're operating in uh, currently, or not, right? Uh, and I'm conscious of the fact I'm uh, dealing with people who have great familiarity with the common rule. Uh, so, so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and then talk a little bit about what our big data challenges are, and then at least spend a bit of time talking about what I think the next steps are. Uh, is very much what my research agenda is. So you can take that bit with a pinch of salt, okay? Uh, you can believe it or not. Uh, well, you can believe anything that you want to believe. Uh, whether or not it's an alternative universe is, a, is, an, op is an open question. Um, but that was not a shot at anyone. Um, intro to privacy and confidentiality. Um, so, you know, we, we often put those two words together. Um, but... You know, essentially what privacy is, is, you know, the right, uh, the right to be left alone. That is, privacy is they don't get your data to start with. And confidentiality is what do you do with the data once it's been collected. Does that make sense? Um, so how do we take care of the data once, once, we've, um, once we've collected it? So... Um, Here's the challenge. Any time you give anyone access to data, there is automatically a risk. There's no getting around it. And so the, the real question is, is, if you're going to allow access, how can you best keep that risk down to an acceptable level? And you'll see that in the statutory authorizations of um, statistical agencies, so Title 13 of the US Code, which is the Census Bureau Code, Title 26 of the US Code, which is IRS, um, both say that agencies have to use reasonable means to protect content. It doesn't mean that the risk of disclosure is zero. It says you use reasonable means. That's not defined. Um, and, and the key thing is, is how do you do this in order to preserve utility, right? And I, really, the, the, one of the reasons I became so um, uh, engaged in this question was, you know, I told you about the, the program I built at, at the Census Bureau, which linked all those different data sets together. So we'd gone to this massive amount of effort to put the data together to be able to do the kind of analysis on the dynamic interaction of workers and firms. And then the next step, after going to all that work, spending the taxpayer money, you know, trying to avoid uh, burden and so on, the next step was to how to provide access. And uh, so Eurostat and the United Nations, the uh, Conference on European Statisticians, has a working group on, on confidentiality and privacy. So in 2000 or 1999, 
I went to a, a big working group meeting of 19 statistical agencies in Thessaloniki in Greece, and um, as I was sitting at the table, every agency described how they protected confidentiality. And every agency would say, here's what we do. We um, top code, we um, uh, do K, uh, K anonymization, we uh, round up information, we do this, this, and the other thing. And every time, each person was trying to outdo the other in how they protected the data. I'm sitting there as an economist, and I'm sitting there and saying, everything that you're doing screws up the value for analytical purposes. Okay? And not one single one of them talked about the consequences of the protection approach on the utility of the data for which it was collected. Let me give you a very specific example. How many of you are familiar with the survey of income and program participation? You're not? Okay. So SIP is um, the major Census Bureau product uh, which provides information, uh, it's longitudinal, uh, on uh, oversamples, low-income households. And it's intended to provide information to policymakers about welfare recipiency and um, uh, use of social security. I'm putting it too simply, but, but basically that's what it is. So um, the way in which when they disseminate the microdata files, um, they do one of the two thing, ways and well, two very sensitive variables that for which it's very easy to re-identify people on are age and geography, right? So what they do is they round age, both of the uh, individual uh, who's the respondent and the spouse, and they aggregate geography. So what's the consequence of that? So you spend many millions of dollars, burden the taxpayer, burden the respondent, if you round age that, and the age of the, head of, of the uh, spouse, that substantially compromises your ability to understand individual retirement decisions because it, it's very much driven by your age and your spouse's age. So if you make it five-year intervals, the utility of the analysis which is one of the purposes for which the data were collected, is substantially compromised, right? What about geography? Okay, so we're looking at welfare recipiency. Well, the rules for welfare recipiency are driven largely in the United States by geography. So if you don't know the state that someone is in, you don't know how the rules affected the propensity to be on welfare. So the, the two obvious things to adjust are age and um, geography, but as a result of trying to protect the confidentiality, you destroy the reason for which the data was collected in the first place. So you know, the way in which economists and people in, in, the, in the statistical world think about things is you know, one of the challenges that you have is, um, you know, clearly, if you want zero risk, you're going to have zero utility, right? The, the best way to protect the data is to dig a hole, put the data in, and fill it up again, right? Um, that's clearly suboptimal, <laughs> although not for some people. Um, so, so really what you're doing is you're saying, every time you try and increase the utility, the risk is going to increase, what you have to figure out is what's your maximal acceptable risk, you know, so you take reasonable means, and uh, you, you try and do the best you can given that. So, so explicitly recognizing that trade-off is really important, that the, the people who use the data and the people who protect the data should be talking to each other. Um, and kind of what our challenge is now is that with the new types of data and the new types of tools, um, for the, for the 
uh, same level of utility risk has increased. So what are we going to, what kind of framework are we going to operate on? Well, um, so, so that's kind of the um, risk utility trade-off. Now I want to argue why is access to researchers and to scientists more generally, why is access important? I'm going to argue there are three reasons. So in other words, you have to let people access the microdata, not just uh, access tables. Um, so do I need to explain why it's more important to have access to microdata than tables per se, or is everyone sold on that? Okay. Um, I could rant about that for a while too, but maybe I'll spare you. Um, so why is access important? I'm going to argue there are three reasons. One is you're going to want to validate the linkages. Um, the second is, like any science, uh, you're going to want to be able to rec replicate any of the analysis that's done. And the third, and I think um, actually all three of these came up last night, um, the third is building a knowledge infrastructure. So I'm going to talk about each one of these in turn. So um, the linkage validation, so um, he here's the issue, actually let me go back for a second. So here's the issue is um, in this, in the, 30 years ago, you know, when we were dealing with data that came down from the heavens, from the statistical system or, or from an administrative source, uh, the data came in um, rows and columns, right? And basically, we're dealing with flat files or statistical files. That's not the way that data are coming in anymore. Data are coming in from, you know, five or ten different sources. So you've got databases with different levels of granularity, um, different uh, structures, and what you have to do is you have to put them all together. And you have to figure out what's, what's missing, right? So if I'm pulling in 311 data, who have I got? What's the coverage? What's missing? Um, you know, who, who, who's not there? Um, and I've also got to figure out who's being double counted, uh, if I'm looking at cell phones, for example, cell phone data, for example. So, uh, and then I've got to figure out how well am I matching people. And um, that's why access is important, because any kind of linkage that is done needs to be validated. I don't, I don't just want a third party to come in, and, or a trusted third party, which you, you often hear about, um, to come in and say, it's all matched, everything's good, you, you can take it from there. You need people thinking about what's being done. And so uh, here's an example of why, why doing linkages correctly is important. So I've got a picture there of the Boston bomber. Um, and uh, you'll remember that the Boston bomber was caught, right? And what you may also remember is the way in which he was caught was there was a lot of video camera information. A lot of people were taking pictures. And that was uploaded. And people then tried to identify who the bomber was. Do anyone remember this? So the, the challenge was, and they, they, you know, they identified it, matched it, linked it, essentially to other databases to see can we, can we re-identify this individual. It's very similar to what happens, you know, on Facebook, right? Your, your kid loads up stuff on Facebook and, and, and you see who the kid is and you see who the other people are because it's automatically linking it from facial characteristics to other information. So the problem with this it, is that um, they uploaded it, the internet figured out who it was, went after the person, went to the person's house, you know, surrounded it and so on. If you'll remember, it was the wrong person. Right? And the family, the, the guy had vanished a couple of weeks ago. The family was completely anguished. They had no clue what he had done. Uh, and then they discovered, oh, it's the wrong guy. And so then they went after the actual real person. But it turned out that family, that the, the, the guy who they incorrectly identified had actually killed himself a, a, a while earlier. 
and they found his body a couple of days later. So the incorrect linkages um, can be devastating, right? So um, having the ability to identify and correct those linkages requires access. It requires that someone else comes in and checks. Uh, any of you who've been incorrectly stopped because you have the wrong name uh, at TSA will recognize that having the ability to correct errors from external sources rather than having a monolithic uh, uh, linkage is, is important. And even for, that, that, that's for operational purposes, but even for scientific purposes it matters, right? Um, you, you, you want to make sure that you haven't incorrectly lumped people together, and you want to make sure that you haven't split people. Um, and so that gets, so that's the actual linkage checks, um, and very closely related, you want to be able to replicate the work. Um, so Kathy O'Neill's made a big splash with this book, Weapons Math Destruction. Uh, you want to be able to go in and check the algorithms that people are using, because it's constantly going to evolve and change. Um, the, the third reason why you want to, to uh, have access is that most research, and I'm not telling life scientists anything that, that they don't know, but most research is, you know, we're all little ants adding to an anthill, right? So, so we're, we're building a knowledge infrastructure. So it's not like you do an analysis, build a data infrastructure, and then that's it. Typically, what you want to do is you want to build a coral reef. So you want to build a, a knowledge infrastructure, and then everyone builds on top of this. That's part of the reason I think that the uh, work with the Gila uh, Henrietta Lacks data is, is so useful, because people are adding to the knowledge associated with that particular set of data. And, and that's certainly what we did with the LEHD data, the data set to which I referred. Uh, people have now been working on that for 20 years. We know a lot more about uh, worker and job dynamics than was ever possible before, that much more than one person could ever build on. Uh, we understand job-to-job -job flows much better. Uh, we understand the, the location of where people live and work at the block level. None of that could be done as a one-off by one particular researcher. It, require, it requires lots and lots of people working around an infrastructure. And, you know, um, when I was at NSF, I saw big science happen just like this. I saw the astrophysicists build research communities uh, around uh, uh, astronomical data. I saw life scientists do this, build uh, biobanks and so on. Uh, many fields of science have built knowledge infrastructures, and the same thing is happening in, in the social and behavioral sciences. Um, the, the size of teams has uh, doubled or tripled in many of the disciplines. Um, the scale of research has substantially increased because the skill sets that are needed to work on these data um, and the access to the data require it. Okay. So I hope I've convinced you that access is important for all three of those reasons. So now the question is, is, okay, we know that, or at least I hope I've convinced you, if you didn't already know, we, uh, we know that there is a risk associated with access. We know that access is important, right? That's actually how you get the utility from, from the data. And what's the legal framework under which we operate? What's the legal framework in which we provide, um, under which we provide access? So, you know, we've had historically a clear statutory framework. I'm talking here on, on, on from statistical data purposes, but it's the same for, for, for the type of work that you guys do. Um, we had Title 26, we've got Title 13, we've got SIPSI. And for, for, for each one of the operationalization of that legal framework, 
um, is rested, as indeed has the common rule, on these twin pillars of anonymization and informed consent. Um, what I'm going to argue is that neither of those hold anymore. Okay? So, even in a survey world, and thanks to much of the work with Frau Kreuter, who's uh, one of my uh, colleagues and co-authors, even in a survey world, it's pretty clear that people don't understand informed consent. They don't, they don't understand what consent is. You get vastly different responses depending on how the question's phrased, uh, depending on whether you make it opt-in or <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> opt-in or opt-out, um, whether you make it a gain versus loss. Now we've learned a lot of this ironically from the behavioral sciences, right? That whether you count something as uh, you know, if there's a hundred people and you're going to kill twenty of them. Uh, if you do activity X, you're going to get a different response than if you phrase it as you've got 100 people and you're going to save 80 of them doing activity X. So the way in which you frame a question is difficult enough. Um, so, and then the other thing is whether you put the informed consent question at the beginning or the end of a survey. So even in a controlled environment, it's the, the meaning of informed consent is unclear, right? So um, it's also pretty clear that when you're dealing with um, trying to anonymize data, it's almost impossible now to protect um, individual record level information. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this in just a minute. So the potential over the past few years, if not the past few decades, to re-identify someone has soared because of the presence of externally available data. So um, it, even 10 years ago, most of the information about you that could re-identify you basically sat in program agencies. It sat at, federal, at the federal level, right? Because only they typically had your date of birth, your uh, place of birth, uh, your race, your sex, your name, and so on. Um, now, and, and it would have been very difficult for someone other than people close to you to, to know that information. Now it's available on the web very easily, very easy, much easier to re-identify people um, that, than it was um, uh, even 20 years ago where Latanya Sweeney did her uh, very famous linkages to re-identify William Weld. Um, so, so the externally available data is, has been a complete game changer in the way in which uh, it's possible to identify. Um, and what this means, and I'll, I'll talk about the attribute disclosure and the inferential disclosure uh, in, in just a second. And, and, and what this means is not just can I identify, um, is, it, is it not easier to identify who you are, but it's also much easier to figure out what you're going to do not necessarily because they're tracking you, but because they're tracking people who are just like you. So they don't even need to know who you are. This, I know this gets kind of scary, but because behavioral and social science has become so much stronger, we're now able to figure out what you're going to do just based on a vast array of your characteristics. Okay? So, the attribute disclosure may be, in many cases, all that I need to know in order to figure out what you're going to do is something about your browsing characteristics, something about your location, uh, your age, and your past history, and I can pretty much predict what you're interested in. And you see this all the time. So when you do a Google search and start typing in things, the, it's, the, the response is customized to you, 
Google has about a billion parameters that are used to identify uh, and, and predict what you're interested in based on both your history and, um, and, and the history of others just like you. Um, so that's what I mean by anonymization. So it's almost impossible to, to anonymize information. So, so let me give you an example. Um, and I'm going to give you an example from three decades that, that's going to illustrate why um, anonymization is, is such a challenge. So this is the Latanya Sweeney example from the mid-1990s. And so in the interest of uh, openness and transparency, these were familiar words, um, the uh, hospital records were released from the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission. So they anonymized data on state employees. How many people know this example? It's a fairly well-known one. Um, so, and what they did was they stripped off the magic HIPAA identifiers. Um, and, and so they took off uh, name, address, and social security number. But they left on date of birth and, uh, and sex and zip code of residence. So Latanya Sweeney went in and she said, OK, well, from those pieces of information, I bet I can put, figure out who some people are on the, um, uh, from voter records. So she went in, was able to re-identify William Weld, who was uh, uh, obviously a state employee, uh, the governor of Massachusetts. Uh, this is in the 1990s. We actually had her even do this. Um, I was an IPA at Census at the time, and um, we, we also had her try and figure out whether she could re-identify people in the anonymized version of the SIP, and she was able to do that relatively quickly as well. Um, so fast forward 10 years, um, so this is in, in, in last decade, and so uh, AOL released web searches. So there's no magic identifiers on this, no magic HIPAA identifiers on this at all. Uh, they did restrict IP addresses. IP addresses are not one of the magic identifiers, but they took those off anyway. And uh, you would think, well, web search uh, queries, uh, you know, you've taken off the identifiers, you shouldn't be able to identify anyone. But by our web search behavior is very idiosyncratic as well. We tend to look for things that we're interested in in our local area and so on. And whoopee, very quickly, they were able to re-identify uh, people based on their, webs, on their web searches. And of course, you've seen the same thing happen with Netflix. You can re-identify people based on, on Netflix. Um, and New York City released uh, taxi cab rides. Uh, and they re-identified uh, people based on, obviously, people go from home to work very routinely, and they were able to re-identify uh, famous people going to houses of ill repute, as you may remember. Um, so the fast forward another decade, so this decade, and many of you will be familiar with this target example. So the father of a 16-year-old boy, oh, sorry, 16-year-old girl, um, had to be, <laughs> sorry, I was uh, uh, fast forwarding. Um, so they, um, uh, he kept getting uh, um, mailings from Target for diapers and formula that was addressed to a 16-year-old daughter. And he calls Target and he says, you know, the kid's 16, what are you doing sending her all this information? Uh, and it turned out Target knew that his daughter was pregnant before he did. How did they figure it out? And it turned out not to be anything that she did, it turned out to be on the shopping habits of her friends. So that's right. So you can, they can figure out what's going on. Uh, how do I figure out my kids drinking? It's not so much that she's posting pictures of herself drinking, although I think she does, but, uh, <laughs> um, but her friends are posting stuff of her drinking, right? And they're, they're posting stuff, oh, here well, I'm having great fun, and Facebook is re-identifying her because they can see her picture, right? 
So um, anonymization is, is simply not possible. Uh, so, and, and, and so this has huge implications for how we think about what our legal framework is. How on earth can we tell people um, that we are going to provide informed consent when we're dealing with data that are collected in ways in which it is impossible to give informed consent, right? If I'm dealing with Facebook data, Facebook may say, oh, you have given permission to post the photo on, on the site, but there are many people in that photo and they can be re-identified. So how can I get informed consent on that basis? What does informed consent mean? How many of you have Google Maps on your phone? Okay. How many of you carefully read the multiple page thing that said, I agree to how Google is going to use it? And you guys are experts, right? <laughs> and you can read. <laughs> well, most of you. Um, so what does informed consent, what really does it mean? And even if they were to tell you, how do you process all the ways in which it's going to be read? It just doesn't make sense. And that, that's uh, some of the work that Helen Nissenbaum in particular has done. Really interesting. Um, so, so, okay, so operationally, what do we do? So that's the, I, I'm gonna, I hope I've convinced you, at least in my mind, I've convinced myself, um, that the, the legal framework is a, is a mush. We don't really have any guidelines for, for what we're going to do. And, uh, and I don't think the common rule gives us much guidelines, uh, with all due respect. And I sat on the National Academy's panel for, for behavioral and social science that, that uh, tried to make some suggestions on, on the ANPRM. And I'm, we're very grateful to many of the adjustments that were made. But I think in a, in a quickly changing world of technology, it's extraordinarily difficult to create a framework that's going to be operational um, uh, in, in this type of environment. So, um, so what are we going to do? What kind of things might we think about? Well, um, historically, what we've done is um, we've provided data in terms of tables, and we've had some fairly ad hoc dissemination approaches. I won't go into that in any more detail. Um, we've had public use files that have been uh, made available. Uh, there was a big push, I guess, 10, 20 years ago for license files, which really are a, a super big challenge um, because of the version control and, and simply security issues. Um, we've Recently, and this is very promising work, um, moved towards synthetic data, promising in one sense and not in others. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then we've also had physical on-site research data centers. NCHS has them, but the, the federal statistical research data centers are a model. Um, so I talked a little bit about the approaches that have been used. Um, so uh, the suppression, the top coding, the sampling, rounding, and so on. We are now in a situation, I think, in, uh, and certainly probably the 800-pound gorilla in the United States and probably one of the leaders in the world is the Census Bureau, which has a long history, published the first set of public use microdata files uh, back in the 40s and 50s, um, and you know, has, has basically done that for, for, for a number of years. And, the, the new Associate Director for Research and Methods, John Abowd, who spent, worked with me on the LEHD program and um, uh, is very concerned about public use data, is basically saying we cannot do, we cannot release public use microdata anymore because the, the violence that is done to the quality of the data in traditional disclosure proofing methods is, is too great. Let me give you an example. Of, uh, of what the effect is, just to, just to concretize these ideas. So uh, inequality is a big issue in the United States, in most countries. So the increase in inequality is measured um, largely through household surveys, although also through administrative records. Um, and one of the challenges is, is that most measures of inequality 
are generated from the public use files that are disseminated the current uh, population survey. So in order to protect confidentiality, what the Census Bureau does is it top codes income. Right? So if you top code income, um, and it used to initially be top coded at more than $100,000, and then they started to change it slightly. But the impact of that, when you compare what happens to your earnings and equality measures with top codes versus the actual data is fairly clear. So if you take a look at this, this is my measure of income inequality using top coded data, which is to protect confidentiality. And then the top line is the measures of income inequality if you use the source microdata. So uh, that's one illustration of how trying to protect the quality of tr trying to protect the data fundamentally changes the utility of the uh, data for a, a key purpose for, for which it was designed. Um, so it has very real consequences. So, um, so what are we going to do about it? So what kind of legal framework are we working in? Um, so our, our, the, the fundamental problem is that we, I'm going to say we, um, I'm half time still at the Census Bureau, so I, I have a federal badge as well, so I'm going to pretend I'm a Fed for a second. Um, so, so most data are, are, are not protected by the federal statistical system. So how are we going to, and they're not collected by the government and disseminated by the government, so how are we going to share this collected information? So what's the legal framework and who has the legal authority to make the decisions? What I'm going to say is we as a community who are trying to work with these data, we, we don't have a clear answer. We, there is, it's the Wild West. So um, the, the, the data sources are combined, they're collected for one purpose, for making cell phone calls, and then used for another. Um, and we don't know who owns the data. Who owns the cell phone data? Is it you? Is it the cell phone provider? Is it the, uh, the, the use that you make of it? And this gets very, very, is it where you made the cell phone call from or where you're making it to and so on? So um, the, the ownership of the data is very unclear. So until we fundamentally address those issues, we don't have an answer as to what the legal framework is. So I know you probably wanted me to say, I've got an answer. We don't. I think the first step to recovery is recognizing that we, we've got a problem. OK? Um, HHS is a, is a big agency. It's one of the most important with, with setting uh, rules and standards. And if the, the, the federal, there is, the federal agencies have to uh, recognize that we, we don't have a legal framework for addressing these issues and have to address the problem in terms of promulgating what, those, what the framework looks like. Um, and because we don't have a framework, and I'm going to repeat what I said before because it doesn't hurt to hear things multiple times, at least that's what I tell my children. Um, uh, our concepts are out of date, and, and Helen has this great line, which is, um, notification is either comprehensive, tells you everything, or comprehensible, but not both. Right? So, so at the core, um, the, we, and this is in the book that I'm going to, the, the, uh, the Big Data Privacy and Public uh, Good book. And then uh, we, we don't know what kind of bargain we are making with people. So for example, um, and uh, Alessandro Kisti, who's an economist, has said, well, you know, a lot of people will say data has value, 
So what we should do is instead of having a federal government marketplace for data, in which the federal government is, is the big father and mother and says everything's going to work like this, we could just have a marketplace in which you buy and sell your data. And, and we already do that in some ways. Right? How many of you have a supermarket card? Okay. So you've sold your soul for 10 cents off a bottle of milk, right? <laughs> so it's exactly what you did because you're actually contributing to them developing a training data set so that they can apply machine learning algorithms to predict what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so, you know, so you might say, well, I, I've engaged in this uh, marketplace and I've sold my, some of my privacy in exchange for getting discounts on a particular good. But Aquisti, and this is also a chapter in the book, um, that I'll show you in just a minute. Um, they, they value their privacy in different ways. It also tends to be contextual. You know, they'll, they'll have different views about privacy. So the notion of an informed marketplace, um, which might replace federal regulation and might provide a, a, a market legal framework, is a little bit flawed. Um, so what kind of... So, so point number one is I, I'm going to ask you to worry a lot and think a lot about what the legal framework is. I don't have an answer for you um, as to how to deal with it. But I want us as a community to recognize we don't have one. And the, the other piece of, of thing that we should worry about is we don't have a statistical framework. Um, so, you know, we might want to tell people that we can protect their confidentiality. And we do that routinely when we collect data. We do that when we sign. I, I noticed I signed a form for, for this to be videotaped. I just signed it, right? I didn't read it. Um, but uh, and people do that all the time. Um, you know, it, it's difficult to provide formal guarantees. So signing that piece of paper in your physician's office kind of gives the illusion of providing a formal guarantee, but it, it, it really is a bit of a crock, right? So how, how can we set up a formal framework within which we can provide a sensible guarantee? And the work that's being done by cryptographers, and a major player in this is Cynthia Dwork, who I think pretty much invented the field, so she's at Microsoft. But there's now a whole bunch of other people who are working in this differential privacy area, including John Abad, who I mentioned before. And, and it sets up a formal uh, statistical framework in which you set a privacy guarantee and says, I'm going to guarantee you within Epsilon that by providing your information, you have no more of an Epsilon risk of being re-identified. But once you've set that guarantee, that then is going to limit the number of accesses that you have. So it's actually the first intellectually um, uh, statistically grounded way of, of protecting um, microdata. Uh, I'm going to talk about what some of the problems are in just a minute. Um, and, and it makes it clear that you know, there is some risk. Uh, and it's, it's the only approach that provides you a quantifiable privacy guarantee. Uh, if you notice that, the rounding and the aggregation and the top coding, those are pretty ad hoc approaches. Right? It was just like, well, it seems like if we do this, but there's no formal way of describing what the effect of top coding or what the effect of rounding was on your probability of re-identification other than doing a set of um, uh, linkages with some master file. Um, so um, the differential privacy is an area still in its infancy, but you guys should very much keep an eye on the literature uh, to, to, to um, have a sense of whether or not to use this kind of approach in releasing uh, uh, microdata files. One of the things that results out of this is that you can produce synthetic microdata files. You essentially um, figure out what the variance covariance structure is of the source data and replace that with, with the, um, with the um, 
replace the real data with synthesized data. So uh, it's very much in its infancy, so it's not ready for prime time, but it's, it's, uh, it offers some hope. Um, let me just click to that. So, so where do I think in the future is? And so this is where, um, how do we, in essence, provide access, because it, it, I, I think I made it clear at the beginning, this is the golden time for doing behavioral and social science research. But how do we do this in a scientific and ethical way? So uh, one approach is the differential privacy, but that's, that's still got a long way to go. I have become convinced that the only way in which you can do this is through remote access, secure microdata enclaves. Um, and some context for this is actually that there has been some movement at the federal level using administrative data, the Ryan Murray Evidence-Based Policy Commission Act, um, which has basically said to census, um, put some energy and some effort into producing clearinghouses for, for data. So this is very similar to approaches that have been used in um, other sciences. Uh, you've got cell re registries, you've got major research infrastructures that are, that are grounded around data. And the issue is, is how do you provide access without physically requiring people to come on site to do the work? Because you know, physically coming on site to do the work substantially reduces the utility of data in its own right. Um, you basically send your graduate students, you never actually get in and work with the data. And um, there are very real geographic and to some extent demographic implications by uh, having uh, people only work on site. So how do you um, provide access? And more importantly, how do you provide um, information about the data so that researchers can work in it? So, um, what I'm going to argue is you, we know how to build secure remote access data facilities. Um, but indeed, the federal government stepped up to the plate in this case, and uh, it's provided FedRAMP certification for AWS, for Amazon Web Services. You can put secure environments up in the cloud that checks every IT security box that you need to protect data. But putting data in is only part of the story. You also have to have people who can figure out what's in the data. You're going to need two things in addition to the secure environment. Um, you're going to want to have people be able to figure out what's in the data. And you're going to want to have people come in and use the data. So those are the those are building. If you build it, they will come won't, won't be sufficient. Um, you've got to figure out how to make it usable. So how do you do that? Um, how many of you have currently worked with data that are in file folders um, and you, you have to know what the file names are and the variable names are when you start to work with them? Right? So that's, that's the 1980s, 1990s way in which data are presented, right? You're going to have a, a data file that is called, um, I don't know, uh, PUMS underscore 2017, right? And you have to know that the data file that you want to work with is PUMS underscore 2017. And then you're going to get in, and the, the description of the variables is going to be V56 underscore 7a, right? That's really not a very good way in doing research on the microdata. So yeah, you've got access, but you really don't know what those fields are. And in a world in which the data are cell phone data and 311 data and all these other different types of sources of data, a challenge is, is I hate to break this to you, there ain't no documentation, right? Those variables really are V56 underscore 7. If you're lucky, if it's a program, but if it's, you know, 
stuff off a Twitter feed and so on, you have to figure out what those data elements are. Now, we don't need to use 1990s technology in order to improve the search and discovery for data. And a research data facility is one way in which we can promote a community that provides metadata documentation and use. So the focus on the, the, uh, what we call a next generation research data facility is inspired by Amazon.com. So when you go into Amazon.com, it doesn't say, um, Yvonne, it doesn't say, uh, you know, go and find file uh, PUMS underscore 2017 if that's what you want to bloody well buy. What it does is it says, hi Yvonne, nice to see you. Last time you came in, you used these data. Other people like you use data like this, right? So what you do is you apply the very big data, the sets of big data tools to link data and to link users, not by the way in which the data were produced, but the way in which they're used. So, and Amazon does it, those same sets of tools can be applied so that we can search and discover these new kinds of data. In addition, as I'm writing code, how many of you, when you write code, write code from scratch? Oh, you're very good. <laughs> I, let's talk afterwards. How many of you figure out what someone else has done and plagiarizes it? <laughs> um, so, you know, let's find other people who've used similar code and, and reuse it. And then how do we incentivize people to share code and to share metadata documentation? Well, I'm going to argue that part of what we're going to do is be inspired by TripAdvisor. So, 15 years ago, when you were looking at coming to the hotel, this hotel, you knew nothing about it. You go on to TripAdvisor now, there's lots of metadata documentation about the quality of this hotel, which rooms go, what, whether it's got an exec lounge, whether it's got a pool, and so on. And so TripAdvisor entices us to give that information. Now imagine doing the same with data. So instead of ontologies being set up from on above and taxonomies set up from on above, get the information developed from, from, uh, from the community, from the research community. And it, Get, give people badges, use that social science uh, research for, you know, the best code that's used. You're number one today, everyone's using your code. Uh, or your metadata documentation has helped 10 people, right? And by the way, then you get linked to other people who are doing research like you and you become a god in human form because you have, this is to a very limited community, of course, um, to, to, uh, because you're able to, to solve problems. Make sense? So that's what we're trying to do. And there's a big community that, that's, that started around this. And I'm going to run out of time, if I haven't already. Um, so we've been building um, research facilities around this idea. Again, partnering with my buddies, the computer scientists, uh, figuring out how to take confidential microdata how to build a community around it. These are some of the federal agency people and uh, city, state, and local people working in the, uh, in the data facility um, and using it to solve problems. Um, I'm particularly interested in particular cohorts, welfare recipients or ex-offenders, their access to jobs, the transportation, neighborhood characteristics, and subsequent recidivism or, or staying on welfare. All of that requires microdata. So, um, that's, I just, I got some screenshots here to show that this kind of work can be done and you can build, at least we, the, the computer scientists, instead of having file folders of the type that we described, actually can set up um, descriptions of the data that are dr drawn by use as well as by the way in which the data are produced. I want you to... Uh, by the book, <laughs> um, and I want to say this is one of the favorite books that I've uh, edited 
And, and the reason is I, I asked, I didn't write a single word of this, well, the introduction, but um, I asked, because I was so worried about all of these challenges that I, I walked through and identified, we've got, I think, some of the best people in the country and the world to write their pieces about what are the challenges and how might they be addressed. So each one of these chapters I'm, I, you'll thoroughly enjoy. Um, and and it, at least two years ago was state of the art in, of the knowledge in, in, in what's being done. So I said I was going to tell you what I was going to tell you, then I was going to tell you, and then I was going to tell you what I told you. So this is what I hope you got out of uh, me rabbiting on. Um, I think I want to make it clear there's a lot of thought that's gone into this. We've got real challenges. Uh, we've got some very promising new approaches. So that's the, that's the end. So thank you very much for your time.